thank you very much for having me today and giving me this space to share something I'm really passionate about, or I've grown to be passionate about. And so today I'm here to share a bit of my story, my research story. So I am um, a PhD student at the University of Manchester and currently in my third year. And my topic broadly is teachers' use of technology um, in Bangladesh. And I'm going to share a bit today about what I did, how I did it, why I did it the way I did, and what I learned in the process. Um, so let's start. Um, more. <laughs> <laughs> So the first thing I'm going to talk about is teachers' own ways of seeing. This is the main theme of my whole presentation, how I try to tap in to teachers' ways of seeing as opposed to my own ways of seeing. So imposing my meanings on them, how I try to break that. And then I'm going to talk about two kind of methods that I use to um help me achieve that. So one is multimodal artifact production, and the other is called Golpo or Adda in Bengali, which means informal chatting. And through these two, towards the end, I'm going to talk about how this whole process kind of changed my own gaze about these teachers. So I went in, in with one kind of conceptualization. And at the end of the journey, I think, I am coming out with a very different kind of understanding of the teachers that I worked with. So that is roughly what I'm going to talk about today. Um, after that, okay. So before starting a bit about my research, so I'm looking into teachers' meanings of ICT, their digital practice and identities in the context of digital Bangladesh. Now, what is digital Bangladesh? It's a government vision. Uh, of the current, current ruling political party, and it aims to digitalize each and every sector of Bangladesh for very rap rapid socio-economic transformation to making the country, it's one of the least developed countries at the moment, and the government wants to digitalize each and every sector to become a middle-income country. And they heavily advertise this digital Bangladesh agenda. So they are trying to digitalize the agriculture sector, the education sector, fisheries, emergency, healthcare, administration, judiciary, each and every sector that they can think about, building up infrastructure, connecting people. But what I feel is more than kind of bring, creating that infrastructure, they're creating a discourse of the digital. So they are constantly bombarding people with advertisements, media advertisements. This is what we are doing. They are constantly arranging events, local events, performances, saying this is digital Bangladesh. There are billboards all over the country advertising this new digital Bangladesh with the connotations of um, connectivity, speed, a new country, all of that. So if you go in the context, and if you kind of engage in the local activities, you'll see that you feel as if you're inside this discourse of the digital all around you. And within this digital Bangladesh context, one prominent project is called the Multimedia Classroom Project, in which the government tried, is trying to digitalize the education sector. And what they are saying is, if we digitalize the education sector, if we establish multimedia classrooms, it's going to transform our education system. So at the moment, government says that we have a very teacher-centered, fixed education system. And the more multimedia classes we can build, maybe we can change this into a learner-centered, active learning education system. And for that, what they are doing is building multimedia classrooms, especially in rural areas. And they're training teachers how to create PowerPoints and upload these in a government website that's called the ePortal. The teachers upload all of these in the ePortal. They are monitored by government officials. They are rated by the teachers' colleagues. They get votes. And based on the votes, these teachers are recognized as best teachers. 
there are very different levels of recognition. You can be recognized as the best teacher of the week. You can be recognized as the best teacher of the month. Then you can be recognized as the best teacher of the year. You are recognized as the national best teacher. So all of this depends on your performance and your PowerPoint. Um, you can get your promotions if you can show a lot of technological activity. Uh, the teachers get leadership positions. The teachers are sent off to international con uh, conferences, international trainings. So all of this recognition comes with your making of PowerPoints as a teacher. So that is kind of what I am looking into, how these rural teachers are, what is actually happening. So this is all the government's discourse that's going on, all the recognition they are creating, the grand discourse. And what I was interested in, actually, if I go to a very rural, rural backward area where the multimedia classroom is, what is actually happening there? I wanted to find out. So then comes the next part of my story, um, which is, so this is how the teachers are recognized. Very big events are kind of floated. So in the capital, the teachers are called in, the ministers are there, the prime minister is there, and these teachers are called up from the rural areas, from very backward rural areas, and they're recognized. This is advertised in the media. This is advertised in all of the news channels, the newspapers, um, the teachers' e-portal. So you can kind of get an idea about how important technology is at the moment in the context. And within this, uh, this was launched in 2012. And since 2012, Every year, we were hearing that these teachers from a place called Hatia are becoming the best teacher every year. Now, that was kind of perplexing for everyone. How is that happening? Because this is a detached island to the north of Bangladesh. This is so detached. I'll show it, show it to you on the map on the next slide. So... I don't think it's very clear here. So it's somewhere, this is the way of the ball, somewhere here. And it has no connection to the mainland at all. Um, it does not have any road connection. The only way you can reach Hatia is through a 16 hour launch journey. Um, because it's not connected to the mainland, it's not connected to a national grid, power grid. And the government does not have the resources to build the submarine cables that are needed to supply electricity to this area. And that is why this thing that people from this very detached area, one of the most remotest area in Bangladesh, with no electricity at all, they only have two hours of electricity per day, sometimes three hours, and sometimes they have the solar panels to kind of support them. How are they becoming the best teachers? What is happening? So I chose this island as my research area. I wanted to go in, talk to the teachers and find out why are they so motivated? What technology actually means to them? Um, so I went to Hatia and I have some pictures to share with you. Um, it's a beautiful tropical island, lots and lots of trees, um, birds, very, very beautiful. But the tragedy is this island is subject to destructive ocean waves, so it's slowly eroding away. That's another reason that the government doesn't try to build up infrastructure, because eventually it's going to go under the sea. And what, when that happens, usually one part of the island goes under the sea, another part of the island kind of comes up from within. So the people have to kind of leave everything they had, go to the other part of the island that's newly kind of risen up and build everything there. So it's this constant, their life is like this constant building and rebuilding of their properties and everything. Um, the teachers that I talk with have moved at least three to four times within their lifetime. So everything was taken by the water and they had to move with their family and whatever they have to another area, even the schools. Because it is so fluid, there's no infrastructure, actually. There's not even a proper road. 
So it's very, very, um, I found it to be very beautiful and peaceful and slow. I liked it. I liked it a lot. And this picture is from the day I was coming back. The water was kind of rising. And I took this from the launch. So this is how everything kind of, even every fortnight, because of the tide and wear, blocks the, you know, the ocean water comes in and kind of submer submerges half of the island and then it goes down again. So this is a bit about the island. Now, with this context in mind, um, I was kind of thinking about, before going, starting my research, I was thinking about how am I going to do my research? How do I look into teachers' meanings? And at our university, we have a research methodology course where we kind of try out different things and kind of talk about what would be appropriate for my purpose and my research. And um, I remember I was trying out a methodology called a visual methodology. So one of my colleagues said, uh, why don't you um, get 10 images, 10 pictures about things that are significant to you, which define who you are. So we get an experience about visual methodology. Um, so then I was trying to get these pictures, 10 pictures that represented significant aspects of who I was for trying out that visual methodology. And I found that to be a bit restrictive. And I was talking with Diane and Susan, my supervisor, in the end. we have supervisory meetings and I was talking with them. And it felt kind of not right for me. There was something wrong because there were aspects of my experience or things that defined me, which were not I couldn't capture it in images. There were some aspects of me that I thought that I, that I wanted to write in words rather than click an image. Um, something very important to me is my daughter's laughter. It's not words, it's not an image, it's an auditory kind of memory. So I was like, I can't do justice the way I want. So that was a very personal experience. And I thought, okay, what if I open up the space a bit for the teachers and ask them to express their experiences, their meanings of using technology in a mode and genre that they like, they choose. So I won't say that, do it through words. I won't say, do it through images. I would just say, express your significant experiences in a mode and genre that you like. So that's how I came across in literature of the concept of multimodal artifact production. It's a research method where your participants use any mode or medium that they like to express significant aspects or experiences about themselves. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, this is kind of an academic um, definition of what multimodal artifact production is. So this is an approach where participants generate data based on parts of themes agreed on by the researcher or participants, leading to an inclusive and interactive environment. That is very important. So when we open up this space, it doesn't become an imposed environment, it becomes an inclusive environment. It becomes an interactive environment. And this enables researchers to study human experiences from multiple dimensions. What I was talking about, from all these different dimensions, I can look at teachers' meanings of technology. So after that, um, and I came across the wor work of someone called Naomi Sunderland, and she works with Australian Aboriginal women. And she uses this methodology, multimodal reflective methodology, a lot. Um, she builds these multimodal narratives with Australian Aboriginal women. And she argues that this enables to tell the counter stories that talk back to the master narratives. So what are the master narratives? The narratives that are kind of built through the eyes of the researcher with no space for the participants' voices to come up in that space. And I needed this kind of approach because when I went through the literature that talked about Bangladeshi 
education system, I didn't find the voices of the teachers represented as the way it should be. It was always the researcher's interpretation coming through in these um, academic papers and everything. So I thought, well, that kind of suits my purpose a lot. So it enables a reverse gaze. It, oh, she also kind of argues that it creates that space that is needed to express your meanings. It enables depth of expression. Uh, so it enables co-construction of meaning. So it's not only my meanings that come through the research, the teacher's meanings are there freely too. So um, after this, so what I did is I produced a, a few comps for the teachers and they produced these multimodal artifacts for me. And I collected data for about eight months. And I ended up with this database of images, diary entries, poems, links, PowerPoints, lesson plans. Um, so it was not one mode. None of the teachers decided to stick to one mode, but they used different kinds of things to express their experiences of using technology, what technology meant to them, and what they were doing with this technology in practice. So after this, um, so that is one of the methodologies I use to tap into teachers' meaning. Another one is called Golpo. So Golpo is Bangla for story. And how I came across this is again in my research methodology course. We were practicing different types of interviewing. And when one of my colleagues was interviewing me, I don't know why I felt restricted a bit. I was given the time, I was given the space uh, to talk about my experiences. I just didn't feel the connection or I felt something was wrong in the communication format. Question, keep quiet, answer, everything's quiet, then a question again. And I didn't realize what was wrong. So again, I remember in our supervisory meetings, we were thinking about narrative interviews, which were stories. Um, it is a format, it is an interview format where the researchers share, the research participants share their stories. And that kind of seemed um, to do a little bit or to connect with me a little bit more. And I remember one day Susan asked me, what does narrative, how is it translated in ba Bengali? And I said, okay, it's translated as Bolpo. And I kept thinking about it. And suddenly it struck me that, okay, in Bengali, Bolpo is not only a noun, it's a verb. When we talk with each other, it's also called Bolpo. Now, talking has another Bengali word, which is Potabo. But that is reserved for, uh, that has the connotation of formal speeches like this. We wouldn't say Golpo, we would say Kakabu. But when I'm talking to another person or a group of people in an informal setting, we'll never say Kakabu, we'll say Golpo. And I was kind of thinking, why do we call these two things, these two different things? Are they different? What's going on here? So that's when I started looking into Bengali writings, Bengali history, Bengali culture, and I came across the work of Dr. Rupi, who kind of did extensive work on Volvo. And he says that this is a uniquely Bengali social practice. And this is a kind of a definition he tries to give. It's, it's the telling, retelling, reinterpretation, debating of lived experiences or opinions with emotional significance in a narrativized format, and it is very personal in nature. So that's the kind of a rough definition of what it is. It's an informal talk, but it's very distinctive. It has its own features. So I was trying to look into what different features does a Volvo have. So I went into literature again, and I came across the word of shame. So he kind of argues all the time that this is very different from coffee or dinner conversations in other cultures. So from my own experience and from my readings of Shane and Chakraborty, I kind of try to put together the features of Volvo in the next slide. So the first feature everyone talks about is there's lots of overlapping 
So there's no clear cut conversational structure. People will cut in whenever they feel that they have something very valuable to add. So Diane is very experienced about this. So I'm clapping here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so they will kind of cut in. So the story, you know, in um, traditional conversation or in the Western kind of conversation setting, one person tells the story. But in a Bengali setting, what will happen is the story is built on by everyone together because you cut in whenever you feel that you need to add something. The thing is, if you don't cut in, if you're too quiet, it's kind of interpreted as you're not interested. So you need to give a nod, a sound or something while someone is speaking or else they won't understand that you're interested. If you're too quiet, people will ask, why are you so quiet? It will kind of be interpreted as being cold and detached. So that is something that is very different from our conversation more. So if I'm in an interview setting and you ask me a question and you're giving no expression, no nod, nothing, no sound, you kind of understand why that kind of feels a bit detached to me because I'm used to conversation this way, this very involved way. Um, so the other kind of stylistic features that this course analyst, uh, analysts see that there are is they're spiraling out and back in. So there's one story that you start with, but because all, everyone kind of cuts in, it spirals out, everyone pours out everything then it spirals back in again, comes in fact. Um, they say that it's storied knowledge, so people are very prone to sharing personal stories in their life. So I will tell a story, then that person will tell a story, and another person will tell a story. Um, it's a mood which is controlled and led passionately by all participants, so you can't keep everyone quiet, or you can't establish a structure, because there's this inbuilt dimension of equality in it. So everyone passionately controls it. Um, and there, it's very personal and emotional. People will get very emotional. It, it will get very personal when they are doing work. And the next slide. Um, the purpose, Dr. Woodley thinks, is communal bonding or building relationships as opposed to conveying information. And some people say that it's therefore the pull of gravity is against productivity. If you are aiming for a productive session, the Golpo will take you nowhere because everyone's kind of pulling it in different directions. And another thing about Golpo is there's a lot of building up of because it's just about pure conversation. It, there's a lot of exaggeration. There's a lot of similes, metaphors, building up of backdrops. It, some people say that it's kind of a creative performance sometimes. There, it's very kind of literary at times. So this is in brief um, how people have talked about different aspects of Golpo. I've tried to look for videos which can show you what a Golpo is. And I found a short film dedicated to gold war. This was filmed in West Bengal, Kolkata. So that's another part of Bengal that's in India. And um, the subtitles don't do justice to it. It doesn't can't quite capture how people are cutting in, contesting the other person and taking the story in another direction. But if you try to just listen carefully, I think you can um, notice how different people are talking together at the same time and expressing interest rather than trying to read the subtitles. This, uh, here the group of men are talking about um, classical Bengali cinema and they're debating about which actress has the good acting skill and which actresses do not. So if you try to just listen to the voices that are coming in together. Um, <laughs> Uh, we've not set up the sound desk. Mm. Then I'll just go on. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, this will be on the website. Yeah, after. absolutely. I'll put we'll it up. Yeah. Diane has 
direct experience. So she can do this. someone arrives here and I'm put into that interview mode, how foreign that feels to me. Like, why is everyone so quiet? Why is no one showing any interest about what I'm saying right here? So it's very, it is a culture shock, isn't it? Very different cultures, with very different conversational styles. So, and you can imagine, so based on this, these kind of features of what, in the next slide, um, I have an example from my, I don't think it's very, can you read it? Okay, what I'll do is I'll put this on the website too. So this was an example from my data and when the teachers were talking. And this was about how the teacher kind of talked about building up that backdrop. So I asked, what is multimedia learning to you? And she started with this beautiful, beautiful description of how her first school was so beautiful. It had flowers, it had vines, it had, you know, she's the preamble that she was kind of building up. So that's there in my data. There are big chunks in my data, as you can imagine that feel like it's not connected at all to what I'm talking about, but it's about other things that matter to them. But that's woven in, into the whole structure. So that was another example of the golf ball. Now, after that, you have, um, I have a very interesting thing. This is a colonial gaze on golf ball, which I found while I was researching. So this is, from uh, one of a, Bing a Bengali writer called Nirod C. Chodri. Now, he grew up in the colonial period and he was in awe of what he calls the mother country, British sense and sensibility, British manners, British proper ways of acting. And he loved to hang out with the British sahibs and Mim sahibs, the officers that were there. And 
this was a country of his dreams. He, um, he co- didn't come to England before he was 57 years old. And all his conception about these British manners and cultures was, were drawn from his readings of Jane Austen. You, so you can imagine, everyone says that it's an idealized form of British manners. And the thing that irritated him most about Bengali culture was this Golpo. So he has long pieces criticizing um, this Golpo instinct in Bengali and how unproductive it is at times. So he said, this is idleness and lethargy of spirit. It doesn't take you anywhere because sometimes you do need to be productive. So try to think about that. Um, uh, and this is very interesting. He says that this shows a lack of individuality and presence of a third instinct. And he compared Bengalis to the oxen of Africa, who individually are not conscious of one another. So you can kind of understand, because everyone's talking at the same time. How do you focus on what one person is saying? And he also says that this develops because you don't have any civilized social life. There's no parties, there's no proper dinners, there's no ball dances. There's nothing to enlighten your existence. So what do you do? You just talk unproductively throughout the whole time. Um, he wrote C. he was honoured by the British government. He was brought to England when he was 57 years old by BBC and British Council. He has a series of lectures on YouTube. He has a blue pack in Oxfordshire in his name. So that is a bit from, I tried to kind of show how different it feels to a different gaze if you're thinking about uh, manners and being proper and all of that. Um, so what actually um, did these two things do for my research? These are the methodologies I've used. I didn't use interviews. I decided I'm going to use Golpo. I didn't use any one format. I decided I'm going to use a multimodal format. Before doing that, let's look at what conceptualizations of teachers I had before starting my research. So um, I thought of myself as a researcher. I'm researching the digital. I have nothing in common with these teachers. And did I have any real empathy with them? Did I feel a connection with them? To be honest, no. So cognitively, I read all of these things. I know there shouldn't be a power relation between the researcher and the research. You need to try to connect with them. But when I look back, very honestly, did I feel it the way that I feel it now? Not at all. Um, What did I think about their practice? I read a lot of literature, a lot of academic work done on teachers. And what the concept I had is this fixed textbook based lessons. There's no other tools or props in the classroom. It's textbook-based teaching. Um, it's teacher-centered pedagogy. There's no interaction, as I said. And what did I expect for happy? I expected the worst possible teaching learning because it was so detached. It didn't even have the facilities that anyone had in the mainland. What would they be teaching? So that is a very honest depiction of my days. Um, and I thought that what was technology to them, it was PowerPoint, and why were they using it? For the recognition that they were getting. And I thought that these teachers had no proper understanding because they didn't have that training that was needed. They didn't have a proper understanding of what they were doing. Um, they were performing under government pressure. They didn't have any inspiration from their own. And did they have any passion and dedication towards teaching? When I look back, I felt, no, these are rural teachers. They have a very little amount of salary. They don't have any structural resources. Their um, classrooms don't even have proper chairs. And when it's the rainy season, it becomes all muddy. And one of the teachers was telling me she had one chair for the head teacher, which you know sits down in the mud. So what would I expect? exactly from these teachers, nothing. So this is my days that I went in through this research conference. So let's see what happened to my days slowly when I started connecting with the teachers. So the next slide, first clip. So this is my days. This is our multimedia classroom. So 
student sitting fixed. The, uh, the PowerPoint projector is at the front, in front of the blackboard, blocking away the interactive space. And the teacher is delivering from the front. That is what I kind of had in my mind. So when, I first, when the first artifact came through, the first artifact was about how the teacher viewed her classroom through her eyes. And this is what I got. So this is my gaze, and this is what the teacher thinks the classroom is. And that kind of baffled me. I mean, my first reaction was, there's something wrong with my instructions. They didn't realize <laughs> what I was trying to tell them. And you need to call this teacher up and explain the whole thing again and get rid of the first plot of artifacts. So I called with the intention of explaining this. But before that, before getting rid of this, I kind of asked, what does this mean? And she said that, you know, from a very little age, I'm a female. I've grown up in a very conservative society. You can imagine, it's so detached, so remote. I never really had a space of my own my own agency, my own creative space, like you were talking about. When the government said, even when I was teaching, I had to teach from the textbook, a fixed curriculum. When the government said that you can now use a PowerPoint and you can create your lesson as you want in this PowerPoint, it gave me a creative space. I suddenly felt free. So the first thing I did was I had this classroom for myself, multimedia classroom. I was the multimedia teacher. One afternoon, I sat with all of my students together and we made these beautiful paper flowers together in the way that we wanted. And we put it all around the classroom. So they have these beautiful classrooms which they have decorated by their own hands. And she said that the first time in my life, I could do something creative. So technology was not a tool for her. It was, I felt, a symbol of creativity, a space, symbol of agency. And she says, when I look at my classroom, this is what I see. As opposed to when I look at her classroom, this is what I see. So I think that this technique kind of shows you my gaze and the reverse gaze, the counter story that these teachers are telling. So if we go, if we go to the next, and this, the um, theme of creativity is one that ran constantly through all of the artifacts and stories that she told me. Towards the end, she wrote this beautiful poem about what multimedia means to her. And I tried to translate it in the next slide. I couldn't do justice. It's very poetic. It's very creative. There's lovely use of words. So I tried to improve my translation for my thesis. But at the moment, what I tried, what I did is did a very rough translation. So if you could read through the next slide. Can you read it? No. Can you read it from there, Susan, please? Yes, Most media means the unrestrained laughter of creativity, the excitement of young lives in the classroom, the happiness of being recognized, a fresh breeze in a constrained life. Multimedia is an artistic portrait it's like wearing gold wedding bangles on your hand. It means the best expression of my feelings. A bud wanted to bloom but never grew suddenly became a flower. Multimedia is a god where I can reach the colours of my mind. Don't think of this as slight or it's magnificent. So that's the point she wrote at the end about multimedia. So you can see that theme kind of creativity, agency, space, running through all of the artifacts that she produced. So that is when I started. These things kind of snapped me out of my gaze. Like, what am I doing? I felt to connect more and let go of the power position and the gaze that I had before. So I have more examples today of what happened. So there were instances where my understanding of things were challenged. So this is an example from a call that I was doing. So I asked the teacher, what about the struggles that you face, the power cuts, the internet speed, connectivity? What about the uh, um, constant struggles that you face while you're using the technology? Tell me something about this. And she cut me like the God wants struggles. What do you mean by struggles? 
why are you saying these are challenges? I think it's good to be slow paced. I don't want that much of a connection. And I like it without electricity. I don't want that much of electricity. Why are you saying, so from my view, this is a struggle. From her view, she said, this is normal. This is life. This is beautiful life for me. So my meanings were constantly kind of always challenged by my teachers. Uh, there are more examples. For instance, Remember how I had the days that there was no creativity. The textbook was the only thing that the teachers were using. And when I was doing golpo with them, they were talking about this thing called Hate Kolomi Hands On, where they bring these objects from their home, um, rice, lentils, seeds, pebbles, leaves, to teach the children about subtraction and addition. So they are very creative. They have non-digital multimedia already and they find ways to go around the textbook to use uh, kind of bring that creativity and life in the classroom so when they said that PowerPoint is giving me the creative space I said you have that space already you have created for yourself you just didn't realize this is doing the same thing for you this, I found, this is a picture where a teacher is testing, uh, I think it was wind pressure, by using polythene parachutes with the children. And they were very happy that day because it was kind of festive feeling. They were making these, these were going up, the teacher was happy, the students were happy. And you kind of can see how different it is from the image that I had in my hand, head of that fixed classroom. So, um, and this is a story that all of the teachers more or less told me about how they work day to day. And this story kind of made me realize that these are not black and white people. They have so much passion and dedication towards teaching, more passion and dedication than I could ever have. And that kind of brought in my respect for these teachers. So if I kind of try to summarize this, he says that I started working from 2017. I woke up at 6 a.m. and finished cooking for my family. I finished all of the work and went to school at 9 a.m. We take four classes and get a lunch break at 1.15. That is when I sit with my laptop and create my content. I have a gap period until 2.30 p.m., so I try to make the most of this time. I close my laptop at 2.20 and eat whatever I can before starting the classes at 2.30. I come home at 4.30 p.m., start doing household work, cooking, cleaning, the usual. I try to sit at least an hour before sleeping at 10. But sometimes I wake up at 3 p.m. and go again on my laptop. I made a target to develop at least one content Sometimes the head teacher wanted me to do administrative work so I couldn't work at school. In-laws would want me to do more work at home. They would say, why waste time on the laptop? So I couldn't work at home. The only time I could work was when everyone fell asleep. I very quietly woke up at night and sometimes I, woke, I worked till dawn. And this is a story each of the female teachers, a slight variation of it, told me. And that is what we kind of increased my respect and empathy towards these teachers. And I realized that the fact that these teachers have very little training and sometimes they do take this fixed classroom, it's not their fault. It's the failing of the state. They, as human beings, do are doing whatever they can. They're going out of their ways to do more than they can in that situation. But that meta-narrative is phrased in such a way saying that, okay, your teachers are underqualified, your teachers can't do this, in a way that puts the blame squarely on the shoulder of the teachers. But I feel that it's more of the failing of the state, the people in power, the policy makers, the curriculum makers, rather than these teachers who are wonderful and they deserve respect, more respect than is given to them in that literature. So this was my journey. And what did I learn through this whole journey of mine up until now? First thing I learned is that 
that there is always multiple realities. There's not always one story, but there are multiple stories. And we need to try to incorporate all of these stories in our research rather than just one view. And we need to be aware of these realities. I'm not saying that the master narrative is wrong. It is there. But that is not the only interpretation of what is happening. And the second thing I think that was very significant for me was my personal contribution. So in PhD, we talk about knowledge contribution. We talk about social contribution. For me, it was a personal contribution. I have learned to try to see through other people's eyes. I'm not as judgmental as before. I'm more aware about my gaze that I have of other people. And I definitely feel that I'm changed. The teachers have changed, not me, but I've learned it through them. That was my story. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, I thought, uh, it was, it was, as a volunteer at a humorous school in India, and some of what you said is very familiar, but you haven't mentioned at all that children were beaten with stick. That was years ago. That has been stopped by law. So that doesn't happen at yes, all. This is what I came across. I was very, very surprised. Yes. I, mean, I, I, I did attribute it to the, the yes. colonial um, um, imitation. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it was, it's really nice to know that they. Yeah. That was paid. Even me as a student, I, we didn't get the beating. So that mm -hmm. was kind of taken care of the, uh, long ago. Mm -hmm. But as I said, the image I had in my head, that was not even appropriate. From my childhood, that has changed a lot too. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So when in this, if you were a child going through school, would you be participating in golf or at home and in your own social settings and then in the classroom it's not that interactive yeah. because what I was wondering is if the teacher's making a powerpoint you thought originally we're going to do it for recognition mm -hmm. but what recognition if any were they actually wanting like you've said they were fairly content to be teaching in this place and in that environment they, uh, the recognition that they wanted is were that just using the powerpoint to teach no, they yeah. were using the PowerPoint to upload it on the e-portal yeah. and being recognized by the whole country. Because you have to understand, these females are in a very restricted environment. For the first time, other people started to recognize them. And they are low in the hierarchy. So there's the head teacher, there are males, there are in-laws, and then comes the female, who is always suppressed. Suddenly, this female finds a place a space where she uploads the PowerPoints and people recognize her, give her credit, call her. And she's kind of, I had one teacher who's very much advertised throughout the whole country. And she suddenly gets this new identity of hers. And that is, and because she got this identity, all the other females suddenly saw, oh my, she has this new agency. She has a new voice. Everyone else started investing in making PowerPoints and uploading it, even by getting up at 3, 3 p.m., 3 a.m. at night, get up, upload it, and keep uploading, uploading, uploading until they're recognized. That is the recognition they want. So it's very much connected, I think, to being a woman in the context, because you can see I had all six female teachers, not a male teacher participating, and not very male teachers in that context are using ICT. And when I asked that male teacher, why are you not? He said, I have lots of important things to do. Women sit at home, so they have time for these kind of things. So he just brushed it off as a female womanly thing. So it's very much connected to the female teachers in the context. Because they are in need, I feel, of some kind of recognition, some kind of space, some kind of agency. So they weren't filming their quality parachutes no, 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 no. That's what, that's what we, I was thinking, that the, it was there. Susan told me one day, or was it Diana? I forgot, that this is, <laughs> this is, this too is multimedia. It, it's just not digital multimedia. 
but they don't understand that. They say it's very creative, but they didn't understand that. They are not used to recognizing their own work because of so much of suppression throughout, you know, culturally everything. So they don't film this. They don't even think anything about this. This just came through in the Volvo that we were having, that they do these things. And then they sent the artifacts of what they are doing. And you can see how this is being silenced by that top-down technology thing, because this doesn't have recognition at all. Only the PowerPoint has recognition in the context. What you say then that they're interested about media is not necessarily uh, driven by their pedagogical innovation, but rather more like a quest for social cultural independence. So there are two sides to this. So mostly I feel it's for recognition, but not to say that they don't want to use it for pedagogy. They do use it for pedagogical um, aspects in the classroom. Uh, but for me, I felt that it was more about the identity than using it in the classroom. Because you see, their art, they um, buy their own oil for the generator to show this in the classroom because there's no electricity. They themselves have very little to live on. So contributing to the oil every time to show this in the classroom kind of, to me, feels that it's significant for them to use it in the classroom. Yes, Maria. So it's able to impact the appreciation of the new appreciation of the community with, like, another community that's, like, more historically connected. Do they have the same? No, I mean, historically connected, but people who are not using PowerPoints. Well, like, more, like, more, no, like more like built up area, like um, Yes, I, I didn't compare, um, I would say formally, but when I did my master's thesis, I, was, I did it onto urban teachers. They do not have the same passion, I would say, as the rural female teachers, and they were men. So they were two men, um, they were urban, but then it was more about pedagogy than the recognition. That I would say. So they were more invested into using it for learning rather than uploading, uploading, uploading at night, waking up, trying, kind of beating themselves up to upload and get that recognition. They didn't have that aspect to it. Rachel? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the actual community in the English day, flourishing in the way you describe it. I mean, was the competition sort of between them or were they supporting each other or how, how did it kind of... So the power struggle. Yeah. yeah. So what happened is they were supporting each other a lot. So I went in with the understanding that they were learning from the training and from the e-portal. What I found through my artifacts that they were learning from their own children. Their children were very good with technology. So I found lots of images where the children are teaching them how to kind of create things and this. The second thing, I, I got a lot of images where the teachers are sitting together after school in someone's home with food and they're learning together. Because they said whatever we were taught in the training, we've forgotten everything because it was just a seven-day training and it, it just went all over my head. After we came back, it's with my colleagues and with my uh, children that I'm learning, the actual power struggle happened because, you know, in these contexts, there are existing hierarchies. So the head teacher is at the top. The male is at the top. Suddenly you bring in this discourse and you're recognizing the female from the bottom and putting her at the top. So there is a power struggle. Um, you're giving her new capital almost, right? What happened is the community, especially the male, they opposed at the beginning of using technology. And the community came and said, you cannot use technology. I had a bulk um, with one of my teachers where she said the head teacher, the male head teacher had made a resolution in their academic meeting that no one in this school can bring a laptop. No one in the class can use a laptop. 
It's totally banned in my school. It's cinema. I won't let anyone use technology. And she felt the underlying thing was because she was getting more recognition than this male head teacher. He completely stopped it. So I feel that in terms of power struggle, I have a lot of examples of that in my data. It's kind of interfering with the existing hierarchy, the social fabric that's there. So implementing a new discourse, a new giving people a new capital is not as easy as it seems. There will be kind of, you know, people who are already powerful will not accept it. Um, there have been instances, again, in Agolpo where a teacher was supposed to go and get her national award to the capital, and on the way on her bus, she was stopped by the police. And the police said, we have a tip-off from your colleagues at school that you're carrying drugs, you cannot go anywhere. So she was stopped. She had to spend the night in jail and could not go to get her award. So you can see the level of power uh, cash that is going on in that context. But because there's so much resistance from outside, these teachers have wanted together. They help each other in learning, in kind of resisting things, and kind of keeping going forward. Yes. Um, thank you very much. This is amazing. Uh, um, I'm very interested in learning what 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 can we learn about what's happening in the UK? Uh, it comes to mind uh, a French joke, for example. Okay. How do you, how do you form a queue in Britain? You hammer a post into the ground. Okay. And people are very colonised. Yes. Col the colonialism yes. has started here. Uh, it, you know. Um, so w with all that experience and with your insights, when you look around the UK, what do you see? What do I see in terms of... <laughs> what, what? <laughs> I, feel, um, I feel people are very polite. Very, very polite. <laughs> so I like that. If you see that, what I see through my eyes, through my gaze. And I sometimes feel what Nirod C. Jodhri said was in one point, okay, that the productivity that is needed sometimes is lost because of all of this golpo going on. Even within meetings, people, when they are in the mood, can be talking up until 2 a.m., 3 a.m. at night. There's this suspended feeling of time and space. Sometimes in my academic meetings, I've seen that meeting started. It went nowhere before because of the golpo, and we needed another meeting. That will never happen in UK. I don't think so. That is one. <laughs> I don't know. It feels as if it won't happen. People are very, you know, sincere about what they're doing. They don't go away places. That's what I see. Another thing I like is that for each and every word that everyone says has a meaning to it. Because for us, the Golpo is kind of a conversation. Not every line or every word has a meaning. All of it together has a meaning. But I feel that when British people speak, each and every word is articulated very, very, you think about each and every word that you are seeing. And I think that is really a good quality to have. Was that the question? I, 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 it's, it's, it, I suppose uh, I, I'm interested to see try and understand colonialism in in this terrain. I, I worry and I, I wonder and I worry about how much colonialism is active in the landscape. So the politeness you speak of, uh, did you know that uh, Houses of Parliament are apparently, the benches are two sword lengths away? Okay. You know? okay. Why? Because people, you know, in the you know, oh, okay. <laughs> kill each other in Parliament at one point. Uh, okay. the, the act of shaking hands yeah. is to show that you've not got a weapon in it. Okay, okay. So, yes, 
the politeness is is to to prevent hostilities because there's there's a lot of I, I, I mean I this this is also historical but and this is a, a friend Will Martin's piece. So I I you know I, I've got this this curiosity about colonial forces in the UK. Uh, you know we look up to big institutions and we have these vertical narratives coming down uh, and you know the, the who gets to make what meaning outside of these institu- institutions so if somebody comes up with a great idea are are there the facilities in this culture to recognize that outside of the the higher parties of legitimacy okay but that's, right. I think, true of all contexts, that hierarchy and everything. They're everywhere. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank uh, you. for inspiring. Yeah.